If you would open your Bibles to Acts chapter 15, uh, we're cruising right along in our series uh, through the book of Acts called The Rise of the Christian Church. The Rise of the Christian Church. Uh, last week we concluded um, chapter 14 with a few fairly simple, kind of ordinary, not real dramatic verses, or at least at first glance. Um, They say this uh, in chapter 14, verse 26, as we see Paul and Barnabas returning from their first missionary journey. It says, From Atalia they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. So again, these might seem like, you know, fairly innocuous lines, not terribly important, but nothing could be further from the truth. Particularly this line that God has opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. This is incredibly important for the development or for the rise of the Christian church as we've been studying. In other words, no longer was salvation the exclusive privilege for Israel. But now the gospel would go out to all nations. And in this point, it's not just a matter of prophecy or promise or even commissioning. It's a matter of it happening. They're seeing this unfold in their midst. And we've actually been a little bit prepared for this with some foreshadowing kind of in the book of Acts. First of all, we saw the Ethiopian eunuch make the more than 1,000 mile journey to Jerusalem uh, to worship God. And there he encounters Philip who leads him to Christ. So here we have this this Gentile figure, kind of one of the first ones. Then we have Cornelius, uh, a Gentile centurion soldier. And he and his family come to faith in chapter 10. Then we discover in chapter 11 that there were some unnamed evangelists who went and preached to the Greeks in Syrian Antioch. And the church in Jerusalem is kind of suspicious about that. Well, who are these converts? How do we know this is legitimate? So they dispatch Barnabas to go and kind of vet the situation and make sure this is on the up and up. So then Paul and Barnabas leave on their first missionary journey, which we've been looking at the last two weeks. And in chapter 13, we see the rejection of the Jews to the gospel. And Paul says explicitly, we turn now to the Gentiles. And then as we move on to the Galatian cities of Iconia and Lystra and Derbe, we saw actually it was the Gentiles who were more receptive to the gospel than many of the Jews who were hearing it in the synagogues. In other words, what has started out is just a trickle of Gentile conversions is now a fast-flowing current, and it's exciting. So that when Paul and Barnabas return from their two-year-long missionary journey, they get to report to their sending church, the church in Antioch, God had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. But as we saw a couple weeks ago, mission work is messy work. And when we begin to promote the gospel actively, we begin to provoke the devil. And stuff starts happening. And so we see that this Gentile explosion of conversions actually turns out to be a prelude for conflict. Now, I'll say this. Conflict is not always bad. Uh, Some of us just need to hear that and accept that. Uh, Probably a lot of us are conflict averse. We try to avoid it any way that we can. Conflict is not always bad. In fact, it can be used to provide incredible clarity for issues that need to be worked out. We need to do conflict well, and then we need to be good stewards of what that conflict might produce by way of clarity. And the church has benefited from this over the years. Uh, The creeds uh, of, of the church, the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, the Chalcedonian Creed, these are creeds that emerged out of conflict and theological controversy but they helped to distill what was important and what was the orthodoxy of the church. Much of the New Testament, in fact, is written to church fellowships who were learning to live in Christian community and experience different kinds of conflict. And so much of the New Testament is written them on how to do Christian community. 
And in this instance, in our passage this morning, uh, the conflict that arises leads to a clearer understanding of the nature of the gospel itself. Nothing could be more important. So there's a lot riding on this one. So on your notes, I have the main takeaway that I hope you get this morning. So if you're a Cliff's Notes kind of person, or hey, just give me the headline up front, here it is. Salvation is God's free gift to sinners. Salvation is God's free gift to sinners like you and me. So on your notes here, let's kind of identify our first few points. First of all, this trickle of Gentile conversions has grown into a steady current. And then we see, as, these, as this movement has sort of grown and developed, there are different questions that emerge and kind of circulate around what's happening. And the first question that basically kind of comes up is this, who can be saved? And this, this kind of teases out that issue of, is salvation just for the Jews or also for the Gentiles? And we've seen God has opened a door for the Gentiles. The second question became something like this. Well, how do we know that they're saved? How can we know? And we saw from uh, Peter in particular, who you know, observed sort of the phenomenon of the Holy Spirit coming upon those who were saved, was able to say, hey, the same thing that happened at Pentecost for us Jews has happened to these Gentiles. It's kind of like they had a Gentile Pentecost, so to speak. Um, and we see this in Acts 11, verse 15. He says, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them, as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? And when they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God saying, so then even to Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. Well, those are the first two questions that sort of emerged around this development. And the third one really comes out of our text today, and it's this. What must one do to be saved? In other words, what are the conditions, or are there any conditions? What are the works or the prerequisites that one has to do in order to be eligible for salvation? And that's kind of what's at stake here. That's what emerges from our text in chapter 15. So chapter 15, verse 1. Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you're circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed along with some other believers to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. Now, there's an interesting word in just these first few verses here. The, the word dispute in the original Greek is stasis. And it can be translated a few different ways. It can be translated dispute as it is here. But the other two sort of options that are available for it, I wanted you to hear because of how strong they are. There is dispute or also riot. And the next one, insurrection, to use a loaded word. So to give you just a sense of the nature of the protest that Paul and Barnabas have, it's not like, um, I'd like clarification on point number two. It's like pistols at dawn, dude. You know, this is a big deal. We have a problem. Um, I wanted to see how Eugene Peterson translated this in his paraphrase of the message. I don't give that full credit as a translation because it's a single author and not a committee. That's another message for another day. But I do appreciate, uh, he's a great scholar and he has a, does a really good job at bringing old language into very contemporary use. He translated it like this. Paul and Barnabas were up on their feet at once in fierce protest. That's an image. I can see that. So the question I think we should consider is this. Why does this make Paul and Barnabas so angry? Why are they fighting mad? What's, what's the deal here? And the answer that we'll see is that placing a condition for salvation upon the Gentile converts is a corruption of the gospel itself. It is a corruption of the gospel of grace. 
The right answer to the question of what, what must one do to be eligible for salvation, the only right answer to that question is absolutely nothing. Nothing. There is nothing we can do to earn or deserve or merit the salvation that is from God in Christ. It is given purely by his grace for those who do not deserve it. As we preached through Galatians a couple years ago, I developed this little, I guess, sentence formula, if you will. Maybe you'll remember it. Gospel plus equals zero gospel. If you add something to it, you have destroyed it. Like trying to buy a gift, as soon as you've paid for it, it's no longer a gift. Gospel plus equals zero gospel. And so what's essentially being uh, suggested by these visitors from Judea, from Jerusalem, is that in order for someone to become a true Christian, a real for deal Christian, they must commit to keeping the law of Moses as indicated by the sign of circumcision. In other words, these works, law-keeping and circumcision, were conditions for salvation. Friends, that's first-class legalism, right? That's legal as the perfect example of legalism. Now, I want to talk about that word for just a minute because I think there's a lot of confusion around that word. Uh, I'll define it. Legalism is law-keeping to secure salvation. Law-keeping to secure salvation. Oftentimes, when we use the word legalism, it can be to describe maybe a church or a group or a culture that's kind of very rule-oriented. Uh, we might say something, we might see a church where they expect, hey, you've, you know, fellas wearing ties, gals wearing dresses, you got to. Oh, you got to carry this particular translation of the Bible, the authorized only, preferably in Red Schofield. Or, you can't have any tattoos on your body, you'd better be unadorned with tattoos. And we will often refer to those places as legalistic or legalism. I, I think that's actually not the best phrase. I think a better phrase for that is what I would call religious formalism where you're, you're kind of fixing on forms of the faith or things around the faith more than the substance of it. And the reason I draw that out is because I don't think anybody in one of those churches or groups or cultures, or almost nobody, would say, you have to do these things to be saved. It's just more or less a cultural expectation and very rule-oriented. Legalism is different. Legalism is, this is the condition in order to be saved. And that's what we see uh, on display here. And so I think at first gla glance, actually, uh, when we see this, it just looks like the singular issue of circumcision. It kind of looks like that's what they're pushing for. But you have to, something you may not know or may not understand about circumcision, it's not just, let's say, a cosmetic thing. It's not just a little procedure. But it actually was meant to signify one's promise to observe the Mosaic law. It's not just a procedure. Um, I was thinking this morning I would illustrate this with my wedding ring, and this was kind of funny. I took it off the other day and put it on the nightstand because my fingers were fat and it was hurting, you know, like it, ha like it happens. I know I'm not the only one. I was like, oh, this is hurting. I told my wife, I'm taking my wedding ring off. It's just because my finger hurts. And I set it down. And then I, I came in early this morning and I was working through my notes and I got to this illustration. I was like, oh, and I looked down and I hadn't put it back on yet. <laughs> So I had to call Amy and say, could you, could you bring my wedding ring? Because this could be awkward if I point to my finger. And, you know. This isn't just a piece of jewelry. This doesn't just say that I'm married. It says that I've made a promise and a covenant to keep certain vows. And the act of circumcision carried the same sort of commitment, a commitment to observe the law. So it's not just one thing here. It's kind of both together. So the third thing we see here is this, this sort of teaching from the uh, out-of-town Jewish teachers creating this condition uh, for salvation put the gospel's purity at stake. That's what was at issue here. Now, on one hand, I think we might all go, legalism, yeah, I know it when I see it, hate it, don't want any part of it, I chafe under it, oh, can't stand legalism. 
But I think that we are actually just as uncomfortable with grace as we are with legalism. I don't think that is in our nature. We do not like grace when we actually get it. Grace is defined as unmerited favor. I was trying to think of a good illustration and sort of, I like to illustrate things, and I was trying to think of a modern illustration for like pure grace. I could barely come up with one just because that's not the culture we live in. And then just, just before uh, I came down to preach this morning, uh, a piece of paper fell out of my book and it gave me the perfect idea. So here it is. Uh, about two weeks ago, uh, I ordered a, a pair of boots from REI. And it came with a $20 gift card. And uh, cool, that's nice, great. Well, as fortune would have it, we changed our mind about the boots. And since the transaction hadn't gone through yet, I called them and said, hey, just want to let you know we've changed our mind. We don't want these after all. Transaction hasn't gone through. Would you, you know, not allow it to go through? And they said, yeah, no problem. We'll cancel it. No big deal. And then I, I was curious. I said, you know, uh, as fortune would have it, I have this $20 gift card. What, what am I supposed to do with that? I, I imagine this is rendered null and void now. And the woman on the phone said, no, that's yours. Feel free to use it. Now, I want to ask you, how do you feel about that? Some of you are going, well, that's not right. That's not right. Some of you are like, dude, let's go shopping, Eric. <laughs> but those of you who are sitting there going, that's not right. That's not how that should be. You have that little pang of conscience, like, well, I don't know about that. Why is that? Because that's grace. I don't deserve it. I didn't earn it. I didn't merit it. I shouldn't have it but I do. That's grace. And the reality is, with the gospel, we are truly recipients of grace. Uh, grace is really hard for some of us to accept. It's also hard for some of us to extend, right? You may find yourself in your own internal voice saying something like, that person doesn't deserve grace. Yeah, that's the point. If they deserved it, it wouldn't be grace. That is the nature of things. Grace is never deserved. As soon as it's deserved, it's no longer grace. It has now become merit. And again, I think we're all more comfortable with merit. That's what we're used to dealing with. And yet it is God's grace that we need. It is God's grace that we are absolutely desperate for. We need God's grace. And that is the shocking and uncomfortable and just raw beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. God gives us what we don't deserve. Uh, Ephesians uh, 2 verse 4 says this, Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. But the reality of things is this. Grace is so easily distorted, so easily corrupted. And the Jewish brothers here who have been recipients of God's grace actually have difficulty offering it equally to the Gentiles. They sort of hold it back. Uh, and so in this case, kind of the key Christian leaders get together and they're going to have a council and they're going to hash it out. Verse 3. The church sent them on their way as, as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the believers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Then some of the believers 
who belonged to the party of the Pharisees, stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. There you can see the two pieces together as was signified. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God who knows the heart showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God? By putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear. No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that we are saved just as they are. Salvation is the free gift of God for sinners like you and me. But it has always been difficult for the church and for people in general to accept this, to accept that it's by grace. It took a Protestant Reformation, right, in the 1500s to sort of recapture and disinfect a gospel that had become a gospel of works and return it to the gospel of grace as God intended it. Um, and that conflict, if we want to call it that, I think it's a pretty good, pretty good word for the Reformation, actually produced for us a really beautiful mantra, uh, the five solas, if you're familiar with this. It says this, that salvation is by grace alone, through Christ alone, uh, through, or excuse me, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to the scripture alone, for the glory of God alone the five solas. In a sense, we might actually say that the the Jerusalem council here that we're looking at in chapter 15 is almost like the first reformation, contending for some of the same things. Just 20 years into the church, the, you know, the church life, they're already trying to defend and protect the grace, the gospel of grace. And interestingly enough here, it's actually this learned bit here, this it's sola scriptura, that's actually being demonstrated in order to validate sort of the conclusions of the assembly. Uh, Look at verse 12. It's Pastor James who will stand up and assert this. The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. When they finished, James spoke up. Brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this, as it is written, After this I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it, that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things, things known from long ago. And then James concludes with, It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. I think it's kind of sweet to see here how sola scriptura was ultimately the thing that confirmed what decision ought to be made. There's some phenomenon that had been observed, but how did we know we can trust it? It had to agree with or be affirmed by God's word. We see this on display here. This is a, I think this is a fascinating um, gathering of people. Uh, it, I want to say like there's a lot of powder in the keg at this particular gathering. Um, first of all, we see that there's this church plant of Antioch, if you want to call it that, kind of the church of what's happening now. And here it is coming back to the church of Jerusalem, the mother church. So there's some pot- potential tension there, right? Uh, the established church and the emerging church, if you will. Then we have these Jewish Christians who belong to the sect of Pharisees, but we also have Peter and Paul and Barnabas who are grace guys. So we got law and grace embattled. Then we have Peter, who was the initial leader of the church, right, particularly in Jerusalem, and he's kind of tapering. And we have Paul, who's kind of emerging, and he's taking the gospel to the Gentiles. That's kind of a loaded situation right there. And then last of all, we have James, Pastor James, 
uh, also known as James the Just, or half-brother of Jesus, kind of the moderator of the meeting here, it seems. And you can just imagine, some people are thinking to themselves, I wonder if he's going to pull the Jesus brother card, right? Can you just imagine, everybody lays out the arguments and he goes, I remember when my brother Jesus used to say, and thus saith I, right? But he doesn't do that. He goes to the authority of God's word. He says, what we are seeing in our midst was told to us long ago. We can affirm this is legitimate, not just because of the phenomenon uh, that has been seen, right? Peter shared some amazing things, compelling about how the Holy Spirit had come on the Gentiles. Awesome. That looks good. Or we have these signs and wonders that Paul and Barnabas saw as they ministered among the Gentiles. Looks good too. But what's the clincher? James effectively says, what's God's word have to say about this? And that becomes what corroborates it. In other words, these good testimonies are ultimately tested and affirmed by the scripture. Uh, The citation that that Pastor James gives here is actually from the prophet Amos. And in summary, the point is this. Through the prophet, we've been told God is sort of rebuilding, reconstituting a new people for himself himself. It will consist of Jews and Gentiles. They'll all be called by his name. In other words, Gentiles don't need to become Jews to be saved. They don't have to observe circumcision or uh, the observance of the law of Moses in order to be called by God's name. This rebuilt people of God, formed of Jews and Gentiles, will be the case differences in all, distinctions in all. And then just when we think we've got it nice and simple and plain and clean, right? We get this line at the end, verse 19. It's my judgment, therefore. Let's not make it difficult for Gentiles who are turning to God. And it seems like everybody's like, good, good, sounds good. I like it. Write it down. Then James throws a total curveball. Verse 20. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For the law of Moses has been uh, uh, preached in every city from the earliest of times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. Then they're going to put this in letter form. I'll skip down to verse 24. Greetings. We have heard that someone out from us without our authorization and disturbed you, troubling your minds by what they said. So we all agreed to choose some men and to send them to you with our dear friends Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we are sending Judas and Silas to confirm by word of mouth what we are writing. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. You're to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You'd do well to avoid these things. Farewell. And you think, well, wait a minute. I thought we had an agreement. We weren't putting conditions down. Did, did we just undo all of that? What, what are these? I thought we weren't going to have any conditions for Gentile inclusion. Are, is that what these are, conditions? And if so, do they stand for you and me? I like meat. I hope not, Right? Well, I think what we find out here in principle form is this. That the church of Christ is going to be marked by unity, not uniformity. There are going to be differences within the church. And particularly in the first century, there are going to be some Jews who continue to keep the Mosaic law, particularly the kosher food laws. And there's going to be Gentiles who are not obligated to do so, which this makes, uh, this makes their, or sort of creates a problem, which is when they get together to have table fellowship, how's this going to go? In other words, these Christians who are together under one name under the Lord could offend one another by eating something or, or practicing something that is in violation of the other's conscience, right? If you and I go to dinner, you're paying by the way, I hope, um, but if we, go, if we go to dinner together and you say, I'm a vegan, I'm sad for you, for one thing, 
I'm probably not going full vegan for you, but I'm probably not going porterhouse. Rare, right? I'm going to be sensitive to your conscience on these matters. Or maybe it's a sort of an issue of music or something like this, right? You know, maybe I love uh, rap music. Love me some hip-hop, right? I'm sure you can see that. (laughs) You're thinking, I bet, yeah, okay. But if you don't, I'm not going to subject you to it. Or it could be a matter of art, for example. It's sort of a little close to home. Uh, I might have some uh, tolerances with art and beauty and the way something is painted or construed that might be really offensive to you, and it would be wise of me not to subject you to it. And I've made an error on that on occasion, which was an accident, but the principle there is I shouldn't subject you to something I have a freedom in that you may not. That, that's what's really on display here, is this consideration So what we find is that these requirements are not conditions for salvation. They are the fruit of salvation. It's a way of living considerately with those who have different convictions than we do. So the letter goes out, and and actually we get to see how it was received in verse 30. So the men were sent off and went down to Antioch, where they had gathered the church together and delivered the letter. The people read it and were glad for its encouraging message. Judas and Silas, who themselves were prophets, said much to encourage and strengthen the believers. After spending some time there, they were sent off by the believers with the blessing of peace to return to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, where they and many others taught and preached the word of the Lord. So what we find here in this decision that is ultimately passed uh, passed out, we don't work for our salvation, but we work out our salvation. Or as Martin Luther has said, we are saved through faith alone, but saving faith is never alone. And interestingly, Pastor James, who would go on to write the epistle of James, would have something to say about faith and works, wouldn't he? Faith without works is dead. Or if you want to put it another way, faith works in the end. Now, many of you who know the scriptures well will notice that while I was quoting Ephesians 2 a little little bit ago, I left off a verse. Did you catch it? It's the last verse of that section, verse 10, where it talks about we're saved by grace, not of ourselves, the gift of God, not by works so that anyone can boast. And the next verse says, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared for us in advance to do. In other words, these abstentions are not conditions for salvation. They're considerations. I like the way D.A. Carson has said it. Uh, I am free in Christ. But I'm also free from my freedoms. I can set them down out of deference for you and for your needs. And that's what the church is being instructed here. Being a part of the family of God means living considerately in it for one another. Uh, I'll let... uh, William Henry Griffith Thomas have the last word here. He's got this great little, I guess, poem, if you will. It goes like this. I will not work my soul to save, for that my Lord has done. But I will work like any slave for love of God's dear son. Let's pray. Lord, we are thankful that The gospel of grace was protected. That it was not marred or distorted in this instance to become a gospel of works. We're thankful for the Reformation that rescued it out of distortion that came later. God, I pray that we would just relish and cherish the fact that Christ came to save sinners. He did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And that was us, and that was done because of grace. Lord, I pray that we would not grow tired of that, we would delight in it, and that even this day it would just put a skip in our step. I've been saved by grace. Praise God. Amen.